So if you have any question on like exam materials or anything, you can ask, wait until the end of today's class, or you can send me an email, or if you need any clarification or office hour or anything, you can just send me an email. So last session on September 2nd, we talked about these concepts, which was learning curve or training curve, uh, dividing a task into several subtasks, which we call subpart task training. Um, and then we had like different levels of uh, training, which was first simplified whole task training, which was kind of a low to mid fidelity simulation, realistic simulation, which was realistic whole task training. And then real world training, of course, which is, which has most of the components of a task. And and of course, at the end, we mentioned that as long as that person does not have the experience of being in the target environment and experiencing all of the uh, stressors and all the time pressures of acting in the real environment, that cannot be counted as a genuine experience. Do you have any question about whatever we covered last time? No? Okay, so today we're going to focus on four key components of training. So in developing any training program, or if you're tasked with coming up with a structure of a training program or designing a training simulator, you should know about these four components because they are key components in any training. Tasks, tools, trainees, and experts. And we're gonna talk about each in order. So first one is task. You are familiar with the concept of task in common language and everyday conversation. But in the context of training, task is any like human activity or a set of behaviors that we can think of that has a specific goal or objective and would result in changing something in the environment. You might think of like mental tasks, like solving a mental problem or something like that, that first you might think it does not change anything in the environment, but in the end, it should have a practical impact. Just thinking and without doing anything that does not lead to anything, any change is not a test. So it should lead to practical changes in the world. And you can see that all of these examples that we talked about in class so far, they are all can be considered as tests, like riding a bicycle, programming with a computer or driving, they're all tasks. And we're gonna talk about that, we use the concept of task in a very um, like universal way to refer to various levels of abstraction. So tasks can have different levels of granularity or abstraction. And what we mean by that is that imagine the task of troubleshooting an electronic circuit. So we have a board, there are components and there are connections between components. And so troubleshooting itself is a task. And if you think about a like less abstracted way, finding the faulty section of a board, like if you divide that board into different sections, each one is responsible for one thing, like say memory or anything. So each section or, or troubleshooting of each section is itself again, a task. In the next level of uh, abstraction, or we can say reverse abstraction, we can see a finding the faulty component or a faulty component. If we assume there is only one, finding that specific component is itself a task again. And in the end, replacing that, replacing the faulty component 
is, is again itself another task. So these are not like different tasks. They're the same task in the different levels of abstraction. And as you can see that we have this whole or large task, which is divided or uh, kind of reduced to lower levels of abstraction, which is like subtasks or small tasks. So task is a kind of, is a concept that is used in all of these ways or all of these levels. Sometimes in the context, they use something like subtask. A task is divided into subtask, but some other times you see that people do not even use subtask because the subtask can itself have, can have subtasks and so on. So it's important to remember that depending on our goal, a task can have different levels of abstraction, each of which can be called a task. In a different example, imagine building a computer program. So this itself is a task. And then in the next level, we see the building a section of the program, like uh, login section or hello world section or any, any subsection or beginning section of that specific program. That itself is also a task. For each of those things, again, building a block of code or a function in programming language terms is also a task. And in the smallest unit, defining a variable, integer variable, double variable, any kind of variable that itself can be considered as task. And then we can think about like each of those tasks. And of course you have to type and that program has to do a lot of things, or if you're familiar with machine language or assembly language, those would break all of these lines into lines of code uh, itself. But we don't go through that because it's not in, uh, it's not visible in the interface of such a programming language, which is higher level. So again, it may be confusing sometimes because it would have been better for a task to refer to a certain thing. And then we had like levels, but they're all called tasks, sometimes subtasks, as I mentioned, in any level of abstraction. Do you have any question on defining tasks, subtasks? Okay, so now that we know the concept of task, we should also learn an important concept which is used frequently in training um, and relevant domains as task analysis. It has a little bit of similarity with what we just talked about, but this is mostly focused on human behaviors that are needed to do a task. So if you think about any task in any level of abstraction, it needs certain steps or certain behaviors. By, by behavior, I mean any external human activity uh, that takes time and require, usually requires human movement. Uh, that is called human behavior, which is, in psychology terms, anything that is observable from outside. So if you think about a task in any level, even in the smallest level, it requires human to do something. So if you think about the same example, just like removing a faulty electronic component, what steps of human activities or what steps of human behaviors do you think are needed in order to do this. 
Yes. Yes. So you mentioned take it out. What do you exactly mean by taking out? Can you think about dividing that into each small step? Okay, opening the case or opening the case itself, it requires you to pick up the screwdriver and then open it. And each of those steps that you can think of, that is called task analysis. So dividing a task into the smallest steps of human activity is called task analysis. So can you think of any other example of steps on just removing one specific component? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yes, that's one step. Can you please say your name? Okay, thank you. So, yes, if you can think of like various acts, or if you just, you can do a mental imagination of thinking about, okay, now it's the faulty component. Now, for example, if you can think of this, soldering for example soldering machine or soldering iron as it's called plugging that iron pressing the iron on each of the holes that it attaches the component to the board waiting itself waiting until the connecting part is melted pulling the component at the same time so each of these smallest steps you might say just removing the component but that removing itself is divided into several steps of human behavior. And it's important in task analysis to think about this smallest level of human activity. And this was just an example. It's not like a result of a task analysis, but I just wanted to say that you should think about that small steps. So again, task analysis, usually those steps that we divide the task are like steps that should be performed in order. It's not required, but often task analysis is done in that way. So that's, it says first you have to do this, then you have to do that. And each of those steps sometimes are divided into sub steps and so forth. And so there is going to be a result. So if we consider a task and do a task analysis, the result would be like a set of steps or a sheet or set of activities, usually in text, uh, in written way that, that describes how a task should be performed, objectively speaking. So for another example, think about scanning a document as a task. And you can see that scanning a document or making a digital, digital copy, you can see that it's divided into four holistic steps. Each of those four, four steps are divided into sub steps. So just downloading software itself is divided into several sub steps or a scanning document on the third uh, holistic step is divided into plan three uh, open flatbed scanner place document face down and all of those and each of for example if you think about 3.2 place document face down that itself can be divided into several human behaviors or just as a new example, cooking spaghetti can be divided into these steps and sub-steps. 
like fill pot with water, which is itself. This one is a better example because as you can see on this column, those are the smallest units of human behaviors that we were talking about. So now the question is, imagine you have selected a task or you have a task in hand. And how do you think we can collect data? Suppose we are not familiar. Most of the examples that we talked about, we were almost familiar with those tasks like cooking, other things. How do you think we should collect the data for these steps that we talked about on a task? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Observation is one of the main methods of collecting data, and especially observing those who have experience or who know how to do that, because those are the people that we can depend on that they are doing it in the right steps and uh, not missing any part in performance. Any other? Yes? Yes, exactly. Um, it's kind of self paced way of doing that. And um, it's, it's one of the way, although I would say it's not one of the main ways or known ways of doing that, but it's, it's one of the methods for, especially for simpler things that you, you do not have access to experts or observation. It's a, it's a very good solution for that kind of situation. Any other? Yes. Your name, please. Instruction manual. Uh -huh. mm. Yes, exactly. That's also a good idea. Uh, again, I would say it's not among the main methods of collecting data, but especially for those tasks that you have access to those manuals of doing those tasks, uh, like say you uh, order and buy an appliance or something like that online and you want to assemble that, there is an instruction manual and in that manual it usually uh, describes the steps that you have to take. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Interviewing is one of the well known ways of collecting data for task analysis. Because again, if you have access to someone who is familiar with the task or expert, you can just talk to, uh, talk to them. And usually, in doing that, they prepare like a questionnaire or prepared form before interview so that they have a structure in for their interview of what steps should be taken. So, as we mentioned, these are the main methods. They are not comprehensive, not all the methods, but main methods that are known for task analysis. The first one is observation. And observation can be direct, like what you see in the photo. Now, one advice that they have is try not to interfere with the person who is performing the task because it may be distracting for that person to know that somebody is watching me now. Uh, but observation, direct observation is one way. Or the observation can be with a video recorder, with a camera. That you have a task, especially if you do not want to interfere with performance, you want to be uh, like, not distracted, 
you video record and then you analyze the video. So, and again, as you mentioned, interviews, like you can either openly have a conversation with that person of what steps do you go through in doing a task, or that interview can be structured, as we mentioned. So these two are the main ways of, or main methods of data collection for task analysis. And all of the examples that you mentioned are right, like uh, using manual or uh, doing it your, in your own self-paced uh, way and realizing what steps are needed. But if, we have these, we have the resources or access to experts or direct observation. These are the main ways of collecting data because you can have ex direct access to performance. So the reason that we mentioned the idea of task analysis is because it's very important in training. Can you think about why? Why should we divide a task into different subtasks in training, why does it matter in training? Why should we know about that? Yes. So you mean training one whole task into dividing that into diff different subtasks and training each of them independently? Okay, yes, that was, Exactly the idea of part test training that we talked about. And yes, that's one of the reasons of uh, doing the task analysis. Yes? Mm -hmm. So credibility of information, yes. Because we sometimes see things in videos or in, from distance, and we think we know how that is conducted or this required steps, but it's not always accurate. And it's always a good idea to have a credible source of information for tasks. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. It be, it's one of the reasons is because we should have like a objective set of steps that should be taken uh, that can be sometimes directly used by trainees as instructional manual or uh, objective instruction so that they know what steps should be taken. Or even if we want to, to evaluate the training or anyone wants to evaluate the training, that person should have a document to refer to uh, as the objective way of doing that or the right way of doing something. Any other thoughts about, yes? Yes. Yes. So in critical tasks, or you know that, for example, even experienced pilots have like a manual of referring that they can refer to in critical situations because sometimes they might be distracted or might just something might not come to their mind at the, at the moment. And they should have like a instructional manual to refer to. Yes. I mean, for sure. Um, I assume if you work for an organization, you were given the task to oversee something, you would want to like increase the success rate to the time, you know, in your position when you were given it. So, like, if you're dividing the things, you can see, like, each task, like, what task individually you can see where people are, like, making mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, if I mean within the context of organizational setting or responsibilities, you might be novice, and your manager or employer might tell you that at least for the first few days or weeks, you have to follow these steps. And those steps are the result of a task analysis on people who were working or employed before that, or those that had more experience of doing the task. And this also has training value. So you mentioned good points. And if we want to de define that objectively, like in short, in one sentence, it's be simply because for in any training, we should know about the steps in a test, the steps and behaviors. And just like uh, in previous sessions, we talked about podcast training, dividing the whole task into several subtasks. It's a similar idea. Or in designing simulator, for example, the driving simulator, we should know that the task of driving is composed of several subtasks and that requires certain human behaviors. And for example, the behavior of checking the mirrors or uh, looking like sideways or straight or when to look where, all of these behaviors should be derived from task analysis of say an expert in driving, for example. Or this is just, a example of a task, but if you think about any other tests, for us to know about what steps should be taken and how to design a simulator for training, we should do task analysis. Imagine we want to have a simulator that that simulator has feedback to the trainer, to the trainee. For example, you do just uh, uh, doing something or just turning the wheel and it tells you that you're going too far or you should turn here or that kind of ways. And to have that information of when to do what, that requires task analysis on experts to have a base of knowledge that we can use for guiding the performance of trainings. So all of this, being said, task analysis is crucial in training. And if you just search the internet, you can find different methods of task analysis. We do not go through all the details of all of those methods like hierarchical task analysis or cognitive task analysis. There are different methods and different ways that people do task analysis, uh, each suitable for certain types of tasks. But just what you need to know is just this holistic idea of task analysis and the reason that it's important. So we talked about as now, can you think about the difference? I mean, this is like inside a parenthesis in the lecture, but can you think about the difference between task and job? Yes. Job is made of different tasks, okay? Exactly. Tasks are usually parts of a job. And for example, if the task is just what we talked about, troubleshooting, the job can be an army technician, for example. Or if the task is writing a programming function, the job is computer security specialist or anything of that kind, computer programmer or anything. So it's good to have this in mind, the difference between task and job. They are in different levels of, uh, or I would say any job is composed of at least one or more tasks. So what you have to remember is before, just to take away from test, before designing any training, any training program or simulator, we need to gather enough information about a test. Now, the main part of it, we talked about task analysis, but you can also think about like 
gaining initial familiarity with the task, uh, doing some research about that, talking with people who have that experience, the goal or objectives of a task, and all of those steps to learn more about the task. Of course, if somebody says, I'm going to develop a training program, you would, the first question that comes to your mind is training for what? What is the purpose? What's the task of training? So do you have any question on the, on the definition of task, task analysis, task versus job? OK. Now, we talked about task as the first of those four components. The second one is tools. And in the context of training by tools, we mean anything in the target environment. And the first thing that comes to mind again is tools like tools, like devices, machines, or in this example, vehicles, or this loader, or the computer itself, or any other uh, thing that you see in that environment in the, for example, in the task of programming or job of a security analyst, all of these details of the environment, they are considered as tools, all devices. Also the details of the location or that environment itself are also usually categorized as tools. Like you see the details of the environment, anything like the room, like different places that someone works on. Uh, these are considered as a more contextual set of tools that surround that individual during performance. So these are two main components of target environment that are called tools usually. Now, can you think about why knowing about tools or learning about tools is important in training? Yes. <laughs> yes, to learn about that and where the training is heading. And what do you mean by? It? Okay, yes. So exactly, that's any, most of these tasks that we talked about, it uses, the skill uses tools, uh, or that person is using a tool. Learning is using that tool itself. So as we mentioned, because <clears throat> simply because training in many tasks is itself learning how to use tools just as we talked about in the second session, I think. So again, if we are not familiar with a task and we wanna evaluate or design a training program for that, we have to do a research or find ways to learn about what tools are used. Do you have any question on defining tools or anything about tools in performance? If not, the third component, and it is trainees, people. Of course, trainees are people who get trained. So the target of training or the goal of training is to develop skills in trainees. Usually when trainees, or um, when we talk about trainees, people that come to mind are usually people that have little to no skills, are not that much skillful 
in a test. And that's why they need training in order to develop skills. Usually young adults come into mind when we talk about it. But sometimes even experienced people might go through some training programs to elevate their skills, or if they're assigned to new tasks or new responsibilities, you might also see experienced people uh, going through training or training program. Now, this is important and it's, it's crucial to know because trainees are very important or learning about trainees is very important in training. And it's usually called trainees analysis or trainees needs analysis. Why should we know about trainees? Yes? Okay. Yes, exactly. To have like a general knowledge of the purpose or the reason that people are there and why they want to get trained and like having some general familiarity with those people. Did you have anything? Knowing about their backgrounds. Yes, exactly. It's very important to know about their backgrounds. And by background, we usually mean their education, their age, their, I mean, what they already know, their, their major, and whatever they know when they enter a training their characteristics in general. Yes? I'm not sure if you heard about this here, but when it comes to actually training them, the more you know about them, the better you can come to the training perspective of the, instead of training first. And why is that? Why the more we know about trainees, we can think about, I mean, can you be more specific about the reason? Like the more you know about them, the more effectively you can design a way to train them. Okay. Some, everyone's of course got different strengths and weaknesses. Yes. If you want to effectively train everybody, you're going to have to, you have to know how to try and cater to all. So you have to know the most likely, uh, I guess you'd say the most, I guess, the top, the biggest weakness in one. Yes. Yes. To know about people's or trainees' strengths and weaknesses so that you can adapt the training materials and the training structure to be suitable for them, to be usable by them. If we do not know about them, we might just come up with something that might not even be useful because they, it might not be compatible with their needs their knowledge, their background, they might not even understand the training, any part of it, or they might already know all of what you want to train them on. So to know about their strengths and weaknesses, yes. Any other thoughts on the importance of knowing about trainings? Yes, all of the reasons that you mentioned are accurate. It's crucial to know about their level of prior skill because they, all of the trainees that enter a training program, they all have a certain level of skill in that task that we want to train them on. And that's training material or the training 
content should be something that they something that they do not already know and at the same time something that is not too far away from their reach so in psychological terms uh, famous psychologist Vygotsky used the term the zone of proximal development or like a space that can be accessible for those people but is not too far something that they do not already know and something that is not too difficult for them. And this concept of trainees prior skill, so you have to keep that in mind of what it means, it is the level of skill of those trainees for the task to be trained. It is called prior skill because it's before. It's not, it doesn't happen during the training or after the training. It is something that people bring with themselves from their background, from their prior. And so just for an example of the importance of knowing about trainees, uh, if you think about using, suppose you want to decide whether you want to use, you have to use a low fidelity simulator or a high fidelity simulator for training. Which one do you have to use or which one is more effective? The fact is that usually as, as the research shows, low to medium fidelity simulators are usually useful for trainees with low or no prior skill because it's simple it doesn't have visual clutter details it's not confusing but if you have like more experienced people or trainees then you will have to use high fidelity simulators usually it's not a known fact but it's based on a lot of research that for most tasks, this is the case. So the lesson from this specific example is that as long as we do not know about the trainee's prior skill, we cannot make a good decision about what kind of simulators to use, whether it should be low, mid fidelity or high fidelity. And additionally, we also need to know about trainees' physical characteristics. Sometimes, depending on a task, they might see uh, stimuli or observe things that are colored, and some of those trainees might, might be colorblind, for example. Or, Some of the tasks need physical strength or certain physical requirements. And before that training, you have to, they must have, they must acquire that level of physical strength. And so they have to work out or develop their physical strength in some way. Or if there is any physical or internal deficiency, like medical, uh, issues that those people might have. So these are more contextual factors, but again, this is this shows the importance of knowing about trainees in a training program. And of course, the reason is because we want to design a training that is usable, that is effective, that is useful for trainees that would actually suit their needs. And this whole consideration of trainees and their needs and characteristics is sometimes called trainees needs analysis. In research, in the literature, the science of training, they usually refer to that as 
either trainees analysis or trainees needs analysis. Do you have any question about the importance of trainees, why we should learn about them, why they're important? And if not, the fourth component that we should talk about experts. Sometimes it, this one is like a missing component in many of the discussions in training, but I think it's, it's crucial to know about experts, especially for tasks that we can have access to experts or we can define experts or there are experts. And we define experts as those that have prolonged experience in the task. And what we mean by prolonged experience it depends on the test. There are like books or this, our own textbook and a lot of other articles talk about something as 10 year old rule. And that is usually they say among many tasks on average, it takes about 10 years for a person to have the experience in a task for it to be called an expert. But again, this is very oversimplification, generalization. 10 years is not necessarily the time that would, set, would make you suddenly into an expert in any task, but it's like an average, it's, it's a simplification. And if you think about experts, they don't have to be like world level champions or the number one in the world. If they are, they are definitely expert, but they don't have to be. Usually what we talk, what we know as experts is those that have sufficient experience. So it's, it's a bit difficult to say exactly defining the criteria for someone that yes this person is expert and that person is not expert but it's it's a kind of conventional knowledge in every domain depending on a task now based on that how do you think we can identify experts if we want to find experts we want to design a training program or train someone and we need experts to use their knowledge or to consult with them or anything. How can we identify them? Yes? Can you repeat that, please? Okay. How old? You said how old, right? I'm, I'm still not clear. How good, is your How good, okay, sorry. Yes, like their performance quality in different terms. And that itself is a point of con contention because some people would say we should define different criteria to judge the performance of someone. But usually for most tasks, there is like an objective goal and to acquire that objective goal requires the quality of performance. Yes? I'm Sean, and you could look at their previous work that they've completed and see how well they did. Yes, looking at their previous works and their records and their background, like that's, or in different terms, if they have, if they can, show you that they have this experience and th their experience is 
in some way recorded. For example, if it's like making movies, these are specific movies, or creating a product, these are specific products. Or if, if it was a service, this is the record of this, their service or the evaluation of their employers. Any of that can be indicators of their prior performance. Yes? Identify errors, yes, exactly. So someone who has judgment, requiring that level of judgment to be able to say that's the right way or wrong way of doing that, that itself should be something that comes from experts. You? Yeah, uh, I would just say that you could use one expert to identify other experts. For example, have Michael Ford identify all of your errors. Yes. Exactly, like in that level, in that level of like world-class champion, of course, those like in the level of Michael Jordan, they can have the judgment on judging other people, even if those other people are in the first level of uh, playing basketball, still because of that person's experience and that person's records, he can be a good, so-called expert, it's well known. Yes? Mm. So if you are qualified to teach something, you usually have to be expert in doing that. Yes, good criteria. Or I, you would say that usually people who are experienced or experts in a task are those people that are chosen for teaching that. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Their previous records. Any other thoughts? Yes? Uh, Michael, uh, I think it's just to uh, show like uh, being able to talk to them and then demonstrating like a basic understanding or strong understanding of uh, underlying concepts of the field. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I mean, this is usually called like um, unstructured interview or it's more like a informal way of recognizing expert, but that's definitely used, especially for those domains that it's not easy to define the criteria of performance. That you would say, well, if I talk to this person, or there are like a number of people, you have to have an interview, specifically in the context of recruitment in an organization or something like that, that you have an in-person interview with them and you say, it seems like this person knows what he's talking about, or it seems like he has an experience that you ask questions to see whether that person knows about the details of their responsibilities or what they claim to know in order to reach the conclusion that which one of them or whether they're expert or not. It's again might be uh, tricky because it might involve subjective judgment, but still sometimes we have to use that uh, because sometimes there are tasks that for which people can in some way manipulate their records and to be sure that that person is, has been truthful in their records, people, usually organizations, specifically organizations use in-person interview. Yes, all of these reasons, all of these ways that you mentioned, they are ways that are used often to identify experts. Like here, we just mentioned a few of them. One is peer evaluations that, for example, you have a number of coworkers or peers that have similar or different experience than you do in a task. And they are asked or their opinion about your own performance is usually used for identifying an expert. Uh, 
that if you go to a unit, everybody is saying that person is an expert. It's an indi indicator, it's an evidence. Another one is records, just what we mentioned, like whether that person has achieved certain records in sports or in any other different kinds of tasks, awards. And of course, years of experience, the distinguishing factor. So these are all the ways that we can have, we can know about who is uh, expert or identify them. So we said that knowing about expert is important in training, but why? We mentioned that, we referred to that briefly a few times, but can you say briefly, why should we know about experts in training? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's, that's like an objective source of knowledge to know about how that should be performed. Yes? Yeah. Yes, usually experts are used as a reference for all the information about the task. And of course, their own performance is itself source of knowledge. Yes? Kind of mentioned it, but like when you talk about knowing the characteristics of the training, so when you know the characteristics of the expert, you can kind of fill that gap to the characteristics. Yes, exactly. It's a good perspective to have in mind. From one side, we have trainees, from another side, we have experts. And these are two extreme sides. And if we know about both of characteristics of both sides, then we can have a clear idea of how to like make the trainees or get trainees closer to the experts. So it's basically the two sides of knowledge that we have to know in any training, in developing any training program. So these here, I just give some example of reasons of why we should know about experts in training. Because the first one is, of course, their performance. Their performance is the ultimate goal. And by performance, we mean how exactly they perform, not like, okay, they accomplish this specific task or they get to this record. That doesn't matter. What matters for us is how they do that or their behaviors. And definitely we can have training goals, like for this holistic goal, these steps or sub goals should be taken. And each of them are defined by experts. And I, as I mentioned before, sometimes we need to give feedbacks to trainees on their performance. Like you have to do it this way here or um, providing any other types of feedback while they're performing or so it's called sometimes in performance or uh, the kind of feedback that is provided during the performance sometimes the feedbacks are provided at the end of a task on how they perform for each of these two we have to have the knowledge of experts to be able to do that so you can think of this expert as like holistic source of knowledge, like the holy grail of training or their performance is the, is the criteria, is the ruler for us. And it, so if you think about it, if, if we want to know about the task, if we have multiple experts, we observe them or video record them or see how they perform. And then, especially if we have more than one expert to study, then we can have a general idea. Okay, that's how 
the task should be performed. And that's the like objective source of knowledge for training. Do you have any question on identifying experts, their characteristics, the reason? Yes. How would you identify experts like tools and Yes. So usually for those specific examples like the field of data science or usually it, that data science itself as a field usually does not come from a vacuum. It comes from like several scientists or experienced researchers in a field think that here we need to define or we have to have a separate unit that are responsible for doing that. Usually those experienced people say in computer science, in that example, or those that have years of experience of developing like programming languages or doing something similar to data science without computer. Now we have to do it with computer. For example, those, those types of experts in those similar related fields at the beginning of establishing a new field are usually called experts. Now you might say they are not expert in data science. They are the people who establish data science. Yes, but you can think about like, we, of course we cannot at the like initial stages of a field that has just began to existence, its exist, existence, we cannot just define experts for that because we need to wait until a couple of years to recognize like what are the characteristics of someone who is doing the responsibilities better than others and so forth. So we have to be a bit patient, but we can have the consultation of those that have experience in relevant domains. But it depends on the example, like data science is an example that I could talk about like relevant fields. Sometimes you might have a domain that does not have any similar thing. It's a brand new kind of responsibility. And it's just, for example, suppose at the beginning, uh, or just 50 years ago or 60 years ago, just came the idea of underwater welding, say, that there were just first few people who were underwater welders. So we didn't have an expert in doing that. So you can think about the similar tasks, like not on the underwater, but just regular welders. So you can, they can be considered as experts. And usually they are the people who are chosen to do the underwater welding in that example. Or you can think about strange tests like that or jobs. Um, but usually what we talk about experts, it's for established domains that do have experts. And if we have them, it's best case, is, is, it's, it's, it can help us a lot in developing training program, but we can also develop training program without experts, might not be as effective, but still we can do that by identifying the task, doing task analysis, learning about the field and everything. Any other question on experts? So as you mentioned, we have trainees on one side, experts on the other side, and we have to know about them the goal of training. And so the goal is to bring closer the skill level of trainees to experts. And all of the four factors that we talked about, like knowing about the task, of course, this whole training thing is about training a task. And all the tools, experts use tools. Now we have to train trainees and using those tools are involved. 